Jim Sullivan, known to his friends and family as Sully, was an imaginative, artistic, and creatively driven rock and roll musician. His surreal, exploratory lyricism and underlying love for the essence of American folk music were cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in March of 1975, leaving all who knew him and the future fans of his work grasping for answers. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Jim Sullivan and the mystery at La Mesa Motel in the deserts of New Mexico. This is Cold Case Detective. Jim Sullivan was born on August 13, 1940, in the Linda Vista area near San Diego, California. His parents, two Irish-American farmers who left Nebraska after the height of the Dust Bowl in the late 1930s, moved to Southern California for employment in the defense industry. Jim once wrote about his youth in linear notes on his first LP, saying he grew up in a government housing project with a bunch of other Okies and Arkies. These experiences helped inspire his fascination with American folk culture, and after frequently listening to local blues groups in the area, Jim decided to dip his toes into the music scene as well. As he entered his teenage years, Jim became quite the athlete, standing at about six foot three in high school. Whilst playing quarterback for his high school football team, he never missed a chance to rock out on his Sears Silvertone guitar and amplifier, the perfect combo for an upcoming 16-year-old rock and roller Jim, favouring the nickname Sully amongst his friends, never failed to spark a connection within social circles, and met his future wife, Barbara, in junior high. After finishing school together, Barbara and Jim married, not long before Jim joined a classic rock band called The Survivors, a staple in the San Diego music scene fronted by Jim's sister-in-law, Kathy Doran. Jim and Barbara had their first son together, Chris, and when he was seven years old, the flourishing family moved up to Los Angeles to continue pursuing music and expand their promising horizon. Soon after, Barbara received a job at Capitol Records in Hollywood, while Jim dedicated his free time to fine-tuning his guitar skills and making connections within the entertainment industry. He began playing at bigger establishments around the area, such as the Lighthouse and Lindy Opera House. Jim's true hotspot was in Malibu, however, at a celebrity-filled pub called The Raft, where he forged relationships with fellow artists like Farrah Fawcett, Lee Marvin, and Harry Dean Stanton. By 1969, Jim's friends convinced him to record an album and helped him raise the appropriate funding to produce such a project. This first album turned out to be his recording debut, a folk rock endeavor titled UFO. The lyrics originated from spiritual and mystical ideas believed in by Jim, and the recording process included 20 other musicians who contributed a truly ethereal sound in addition to its country music roots. Not being much of a promoter himself, Jim let his indie record label, Moni Records, advertise UFO. The word circulated through a few unknown music circles and was rumored to be a topic out in Nashville, where Johnny Cash's manager was thought to be an interested party. Even Jim's wife, Barbara, attempted to use her connections at Capitol Records to secure a big name like Beach Boys producer Nick Vinay to pick up Jim as an artist, but no one took the bait. Unfortunately, the album never caught fire despite Jim and his friends' enthusiasm, and UFO was left for a small reissue at the Century City label. Two years later, Jim threw together additional resources to release a second album, this time a self-titled project called Jim Sullivan, through Playboy Records, completely unrelated to the Playboy brand. Again, the album gained little traction, theorized to be the result of heavy production values that covered up the clever lyrics written by Jim. In the end, after the two projects were a relative failure, Jim and his wife Barbara struggled to get back on their feet at full force and turned to alcohol, where their marriage began to crumble as their careers dwindled into darkness. 
Years passed before Jim decided that his time in Los Angeles was nearing a stalemate and decided to relocate his musical endeavors to Nashville, Tennessee, where his former bandmate and sister, Kathy Doran, resided. Jim packed up his belongings in his old Volkswagen Bug and told his family to wait and see if he made it big before coming with him. He didn't hesitate and drove out east, making it as far as Santa Rosa, New Mexico, before getting pulled over by State Highway Patrol for swerving on the road due to fatigue. To rest for the upcoming journey, Jim headed into town and checked in to La Mesa Motel, called his wife from a nearby payphone and brought a handle of liquor at a local store. What proceeded is unknown, because later that night, Jim Sullivan was last seen walking into the New Mexico desert away from civilization, into the dusty abyss, only to vanish and never be heard from again. Jim Sullivan's journey truly began in 1968 when he uprooted his family from the perfectly weathered San Diego, California to the heart of the entertainment industry's playground, Los Angeles. He, Barbara and Chris, left to engage with the world of rock and roll and dedicated his life to his craft, a true love with music and mysticism. From 1968 to the early part of 1970, the Sullivan family makes a name for themselves. Barbara secures employment at the legendary Capitol Records in Hollywood, while Jim shares his talents with the rest of Southern California. Jim links up with movie stars and fellow musicians, combining a natural gravitas with pure artistic skills. He makes many friends and frequently plays at packed houses at the Raft Pub near Malibu. In 1969, Jim's album titled UFO is released to a bit of critical acclaim and all signs point to stardom for the folk musician and his family. However, as the dog days of 1970 came and went, Jim's lyrical prowess loses its luster with Alley Heavyweight, and he turns to smaller record labels to produce another album. Sadly, the borderline experimental soundtrack never takes off like he hoped, and Jim is left to return to play in the dimly lit clubs he once gained his footing in. Following the track marks of failure and losing the glimmer of success that Hollywood once brought upon the Sullivan family, both Jim and Barbara turn to alcohol, and between 1972 and 1974, they see their once sturdy marriage begin to crumble. In the late winter months of 1975, Jim decides to go against the grain and move out east to Nashville, Tennessee, in hopes to restart his career as a musician in a prominent folk and country music hotspot. Jim and Barbara discuss the family aspect of the proposed transition, and they agree that she and their son Chris will wait to see if Jim captures success before joining him on the cross-country relocation. So on the morning of March the 4th, 1975, Jim packs personal belongings into his old Volkswagen Bug and says goodbye to the town he once dreamed of sparking stardom in. Between noon and 1pm later that day, Jim physically departs from his family in Los Angeles, hops on the national highway and heads east on Route 66. Fifteen long and lonely hours of driving pass by before Jim is pulled over by police for unintentionally swerving around the roads outside of Santa Rosa, New Mexico in the wee hours of March the 5th sometime around 3 or 4 a.m. After the traffic stop, Jim is taken into the Santa Rosa police station to take a sobriety test. He proves he has no alcohol or illicit substances in his system and passes the exam. The officers determine Jim is suffering from fatigue after a taxing drive across 900 miles and three state lines, and recommend he finds lodging to rest. Later that morning, Jim checks in to La Mesa Motel right off of Route 66 in Santa Rosa, However, he doesn't unload any of his belongings, and at some point during the day, he leaves the room key locked inside of the room. An undetermined amount of time passes, and Jim walks to the nearest liquor store and buys a handle of vodka. It's unknown if he immediately consumes the alcohol, but he's then soon witnessed getting back into his Volkswagen and driving around the Santa Rosa area. In the afternoon of March the 5th, Jim drives out to a ranch about 26 miles southeast of Santa Rosa, a piece of land reportedly owned and lived on by the Ganetti family. It's unclear what exactly happened at the Ganetti ranch out in the middle of nowhere. However, it's been reported that Jim drove up to the nearby road where an older Italian woman who spoke little English met him with some ranch hands. When she asked him if he had a problem, Jim replied, no, do you? 
Other reports mention Jim driving all the way up to the ranch house and knocking on the door, much to the confusion of Mrs. Gannetti. Regardless of what exactly conspired, Jim leaves his vehicle behind on the ranch that evening of March the 5th, 1975, and walks off the property towards the endless desert. This is the last confirmed sighting of Jim Sullivan. In the next couple of days following March the 5th, after Jim's communication ceases, his disappearance is investigated by Santa Rosa authorities. They trace his final steps around town, ending at the Gannetti family ranch. They find his Volkswagen bug off on the side with the doors locked and the engine completely dead. Inside are Jim's personal artifacts, including his wallet, his guitar, and a bunch of old musical gear and personal audio tapes. Nobody on the property knew where Jim wandered off to, only that he was seen walking away from the vehicle. A road worker who had been laboring near the vanishing site that day, a man named Sammy Chavez, later recalls seeing the Volkswagen sitting in the middle of a dirt road. He says it was quite a strange sight, and when he headed back the other way after his shift, all of the doors on the bug had been opened where police were searching. On March the 8th, the Volkswagen is towed away from the Gannetti family ranch and assumably taken into custody. However, what happens to the Volkswagen bug is still unknown to this day. In the preceding two weeks of the investigation, countless law enforcement officials searched the nearby New Mexico desert for any sign of Jim, including the New Mexico State Police, the Santa Rosa Police, and multiple volunteer chains. The Sullivan family quickly make their way to Santa Rosa to aid in the search as well. News stations and publications all around write stories and release missing person notices to help spread awareness. However, no leads come to fruition. Around the same time that the Jim Sullivan disappearance is investigated by local and state police, the sheriff of Santa Rosa retires, while the Gannetti family moves to Hawaii. Neither the sheriff nor the Gannettis would ever be interviewed or questioned after those events. At the end of March, investigators discover a badly decomposing body eight miles west of Las Cruces, a New Mexico town almost 250 miles away from Santa Rosa. The body in question does have a striking resemblance to Jim despite the erosion, and is initially thought to be his corpse. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, a local newspaper headlines reports that the body was indeed not Jim Sullivan, and that no other leads were available at the time. Forty years later, not a shred of evidence or trace leading to Jim is found by either professional investigators or amateur sleuths. In 2010, a music producer named Matt Sullivan, with no relation to Jim, from Light in the Attic Records, heard about Jim's puzzling legend and set out to find answers. While he was able to talk to some people who vaguely knew Jim from his days in Los Angeles, he was unable to crack the case of his disappearance. Although Matt was able to remaster Jim's two rock and roll albums, resetting UFO as a cult classic and prized piece of art amongst fans who were equally as mystified by Jim Sullivan's disappearance as we are today. In the spellbinding case of Jim's disappearance, not many useful clues were unearthed. There were no security cameras at La Mesa Motel or official records of Jim interacting with anybody specific, either in town or at the ranch. There was no blood, no goodbye letter, and no footprints. However, investigators did find something of suspicion a few weeks into their manhunt. A major discovery that was thought to be the resolution, a decomposing body of a middle-aged man found abandoned in New Mexico desert. The body in question had multiple similarities to Jim, the corpse was of a man appearing to be in his 30s or 40s, standing at about 6 feet 2 inches. Both the body and Jim weighed about 180 pounds and sported a tattoo on their right forearms. They each had a moustache and a rough short beard. When this revelation was first announced through the New Mexico media, journalists and citizens alike were convinced it was the body of Jim Sullivan. Unfortunately, their certainty was short-lived when the same news outlets reported the body was that of someone else, meaning Jim was most likely still lost out in the world. There are a few curious details about this case point that don't add up. First and foremost, no official police announcement regarding the body or its identity was ever released to the public. Thus, neither the people at the time, nor people now, know exactly whose body was discovered that spring. 
The fact that both Jim and the corpse were of similar builds didn't raise any red flags, but taking into consideration the similar facial hair and tattoo were of the same length and location is borderline inconceivable. It raises many questions, biggest of which is if Jim's family ever identified the body. All the news reports stated was the body was later proved not to be that of Sullivan, but there's no official medical announcement or law enforcement comment on the matter. Sadly, DNA forensics weren't in the picture back in 1975 and wouldn't have been available to correctly ID the John Doe. Another difficult detail to comprehend is the land where police found the unidentified corpse. The body was in the desert outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico, the second largest city of the state found in the Mesilla Valley. Mysteriously, Las Cruces is seated near the southern border of New Mexico almost 250 miles away from Santa Rosa. So even if there was an identification error and the body was truly that of Jim, it would mean he had somehow traveled 250 miles by foot across barren desert in a different direction than where he was last seen and died quickly enough that his body would be decomposed past easy recognition. Neither scenario adds up, making the corpse case point a catch 22 and offering quite a few foundations to endless theories regarding Jim's disappearance. Clouds of mystery have surrounded Jim Sullivan since that clear sunny evening on March the 5th. Without eyewitness testimony or hard evidence, the number of potential endings to Jim's story is vast, if there's truly an ending at all. However, there are a few with interesting ties to his friends, family, and short-lived history in Santa Rosa, involving links to police corruption, the Chicago Mafia, supernatural abduction, and even a staged farewell. First and foremost, we must consider the role of local law enforcement during Jim's time in Santa Rosa. It's possible that when Jim arrived in the small New Mexico town, he managed to upset authorities by either something he said or by seeing something he shouldn't have witnessed. It's been confirmed that Jim had at least one point of contact with a police officer outside of city limits when he was swerving across the road and was taken into the station for alcohol testing. The only piece of information known regarding what happened inside of the police department, however, is that Jim passed the alcohol test and was released. Whether or not Jim was forced inside or harassed during his stay is unknown, but certainly possible. Jim was a larger man, and while he was always regarded as a calm and collected individual, authorities could have seen him as a stranger to the area and treated him as a threat. Or maybe Jim was upset with the entire ordeal and caused a scene either at the traffic stop or during his test. Regardless, without knowing what truly happened with the officers, it's impossible to rule out a situation escalating into chaos. So if Jim had made himself an enemy with local authorities, it's likely the police were called when Jim traveled to the Ganetti family ranch with a handle of vodka. Jim could have been drunk and in a bad mood from the previous encounter and trespassing on a private property as an unknown figure could have caused Mrs. Ganetti to phone the police. When police arrived and saw it was Jim once again, they could have taken action into their own hands. It's possible they let Jim go off on his own into the desert and waited until he was gone to pick him back up. On the other hand, it's also possible the police never interacted with him a second time, instead finding him dead in the desert after the fact, and instead of investigating the cause of death, moved his corpse out of Santa Rosa and ignoring the situation. This would give explanation to why the John Doe corpse looks so similar to Jim's appearance, yet was discovered 250 miles away from his last sighting. These police tamperings would also explain another peculiar and disturbing anomaly recently found in the case. NAMAS, or the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, is a database of all the people who have vanished or died without an identity. It covers the entire United States and is a brilliant tool in keeping track of DNA, police records and real-time updates. However, missing from the NAMAS database is Jim Sullivan. While it's not exactly a major surprise, seeing as though this case is 40 years cold, it did motivate John Lorden to look into the error but what Lorden found is the most interesting fact of all. There is no official missing persons case filed in New Mexico, either by state police or by Santa Rosa law enforcement. There are no mentions of the case in police archives and no departmental documentation about a search for Jim Sullivan 
either in 1975 or otherwise. Now, while this can simply be explained by the possibility that Barbara, or any other member of the Sullivan family, never filed an actual missing persons report, the fact of the matter is, besides newspaper articles, there is no written communication providing a search even existed. 45 years ago, in small community or not, zero police profiles is more suspicious than coincidental, hinting that local authorities may have had a piece of the pie in whatever crime or cover-up was committed. Not to mention the fact that the local Santa Rosa Sheriff retired and moved away right after the investigation began. Another theory centers on the vague relevance of the Ganetti family and their rumored connections to Chicago crime and mafia ties. A few citizens near the Santa Rosa area claimed the Ganetti family had a history with illicit activities and were operating under direction from powerful people in a Chicago gang organization. Now, whether or not this was the actual dealings of an Italian mafia, or just folklore turned into hyperbole is unknown, but with multiple claims that the Ganetti family were known for bad behavior, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they dealt with Jim's arrival using illegal means. If Jim truly did trespass on the Ganetti family ranch and disrespected Mrs. Ganetti, it makes sense that another member of the family or one of their colleagues came around and took care of Jim who could have been drunk and insubordinate. If they indeed killed Jim and had experience with that sort of thing, they knew how to dispose of a body and leave no trace, or they planted the body down in Las Cruces and paid off the proper authorities to sway public knowledge. Now why an organized crime family would drop a body off in the same state and general area of the murder is nonsensical. So if the Ganetti family truly is responsible, they are probably the only ones with knowledge regarding Jim's exact location and what happened in the first place. It's worth noting that none of these claims can be confirmed nor denied with observable proof that Jim even made contact with the family. However, it should also be stated that the Ganettis packed up, left New Mexico and moved to Hawaii at the same time the Santa Rosa Sheriff retired, just as the hunt for Jim and relevant clues heated up. The last three stemming from homicidal origins is that Jim was actually running away from trouble stirred up in Los Angeles and got caught before he could escape. Jim became a socialite in LA, meeting many celebrities and fellow musicians as he performed at various clubs. One of his favorite places was The Raft, now called The Real Inn, where he played with the cream of the crop. He might have somewhere down the line fixed in with the wrong group of people at The Raft or a similar joint, got desperate for money and was unable to pay off his debts when his scheme reached a dead end. Thus, he packed up everything, asked his family to stay put, and made a run for it, only to be caught up in the end. It would explain why he was so set on driving 15 hours, and then on the first day of his journey, pushed himself past his mental limit. Maybe after spending time at the police station, he knew his followers were hot on the trail, so he attempted to find solace at a local residence and ended up at the Ganetti Ranch. When he was denied help, he knew it was the last straw, and his pursuers picked him up after a short chase. It would also explain why Jim booked a room at the motel but never settled in, signaling he was either trying to stage his farewell or throw his pursuers off their tracks, unfortunately running into them anyway. The biggest evidence against this theory is that it's been told through the years by many known associates of Jim and his family that Jim avoided conflict at all costs and was quite soft-spoken. However, it still does take into consideration his turn towards alcohol and the pitfalls of broken dreams. We have reached out to the current owner of The Real Inn to see if they had any connections to employees still around from the days of the Raft Pub and Jim's playing circuit. The owner, Andy Leonard, informed us of a former bartender, Ralph O'Hara, whose knowledge of the restaurant dated back to the 1950s. Sadly, upon further investigation, Ralph O'Hara passed away in 2015 leaving the pool of witnesses to Jim's alley life in short supply. One popular hypothesis revolving around Jim has led to his music reaching a cult classic status, specifically his debut album titled UFO, with people believing Jim wandered into the New Mexico desert and encountered intelligent extraterrestrial life, and whether it was by his own free will or under abduction left our planet with supernatural beings. These conspiracies draw inspection to Jim's music and the aforementioned UFO album, in which he uses surreal lyrics and experimental sound design to build his artistic style. 
The combination of strange soundscape and mystical songwriting lead many to believe Jim had a deeper understanding of otherworldly themes and ideas. These highlights convince some circles that Jim left on his own accord, rather than living with others out in the universe than with the turmoil of failure on Earth. And while the alien abduction conspiracy theory is as often used yet skeptically charged urban legend, Jim's own family doesn't rule out the possibility themselves, saying it would have been a fitting goodbye for Jim and his mystical philosophies. In reality, Jim's UFO album was more creative circumstance than actual extraterrestrial communication. The song titled after the album is actually just an existential metaphor, describing a religious figure of alien and appears more like a coincidence than proof of interactions with intergalactic life forms. After analysing all of the puzzle pieces to Jim Sullivan's disappearance and his life surrounding the events, it truly is almost impossible to decide on a solid conclusion to an endlessly confusing event. No theory can be ruled out, with such little and conflicting testimonies from everyone involved, but one rarely discussed sequence sticks out a little more than the rest. We believe Jim fully intended to rekindle his music passion in Nashville when he left Los Angeles, but during his grueling 15-hour drive into New Mexico that ended with fatigue and external conflict, he turned back to the bottle and in a stupper walked out into the desert with the intention never to return again. It's important to remember what Jim's personal life was like in 1975. His marriage was on the brink and two massive creative endeavors ended up as major flops, providing zero reward to the struggle and artist experiences whilst chasing their dreams in the City of Angels. Combine the overall turmoil of American culture and the state of the world at the moment in time, anxieties and anguish most likely took over Jim's emotions as he battled with the shrouds of darkness circling his family and career. Thus Jim packed up all his belongings and set himself on a trail of redemption. When he couldn't weather the long haul journey anymore, he was stopped by police, and most likely stereotyped as an outsider, a tall bulky man with a scraggly beard and leather jacket after dealing with the mild aggravation of law enforcement. Jim purchased alcohol, the only comfort he knew anymore. Feeling as if the journey was insurmountable, he most likely pondered what he would do next in his motel room, eventually deciding to leave without notice. So he locked his key in his room, drove out to a place where his car would be found, and the trace would end, explaining the approximation to the Ganetti Ranch. Drunk and disorientated, Jim probably stumbled out into the desert, letting go of life behind him and submitting himself to the unknown and undeniable shadow of deserted wilderness. What happened to Jim's body will most likely remain a mystery, but taking into consideration the landscape, whatever he left behind was scavenged by wild animals or buried by a third party after he was found dusty in his demise. The area around Santa Rosa is also known for its unusual number of lakes and bodies of water, potential grounds for where Jim could have wandered off to and drowned in while drunk. Had he gotten far enough on foot, Jim could have also disappeared into the surrounding mountains, either dying in the hills or living off the land for a short while. It's unclear if the search efforts throughout the years included the myriad bodies of water or mountainous regions, and if they didn't, Jim's body could easily have decomposed. Many of those close to Jim claim that he wouldn't have left on his own accord and not taken his guitar with him. However, if Jim was under the influence, his attachment to the instrument might never have crossed his mind. One of the most fascinating aspects to this conclusion is a statement made by Jim's former producer, Bob Ginter. Ginter said that one day, back during their rock and roll endeavors, in the early morning hours after a long night, the two men talked about what they would do if they had to disappear. Jim responded that he'd walk into the desert and never come back. It's easy to brush the statement off as coincidental, but even if it was just a subconscious desire, Jim had the thought to walk into the desert before he disappeared. And when factoring in Jim's addiction to the substance that brought forth subconscious feelings, it makes sense that he reconnected to the past ideation after drinking, turning to the New Mexico wilderness when all was lost. One of his more famous songs from the UFO album titled Jerome included the following lyrics. A more natural pose I couldn't bear to see, and I hope that these people never visit me. It's my time to go, I just want the wind to blow, my ashes until they're completely out of sight.
Nevertheless, the story of Jim and the vanishing on March the 5th, 1975 has intrigued all who have discovered the enigma, either through his music or by chance. Some folks believe Jim could even still be alive. A woman by the name of Tracy Pierce worked at a foster home in the Eugene Springfield, Oregon area about 30 years ago, helping tend to patients who needed a place to stay and care for serious brain injuries. She states that one of her patients back in the day bore a striking resemblance to Jim. Tracy also said he said he got beat up and left for dead in the desert. He crawled back to the road and someone brought him to the hospital. He was paralyzed from the waist down, but would still get himself up every morning and get dressed. I thought he said it was Nevada, but it was almost 30 years ago. He was a nice guy, but kept to himself. We have reached out to Tracy for further comments, but have yet to hear back. Regardless, as we continue to search for clues in the case of Jim's disappearance, let's also remember his unparalleled style as a musician and unforgettably unique talent in writing lyrics. With the right circumstances and a better support system, many believe Jim could have found a beautiful success as a folk artist and taken off into stardom. His two albums were remastered by the Light in the Attic Records and Matt Sullivan, a producer who has no relation to Jim but has published a few pieces about him and his legacy and can be found in many places around the internet. Take a listen and picture Jim as a brilliant soul, a symbol of daring dreams and special talents. Remember his friendly demeanor and positive spirit as he helped listeners around the country escape into worlds of melody and magic. The creativity and imagination will last forever, but hopefully mysteries of Jim Sullivan, the highwayman, are solved one day soon. This has been Cold Case Detective.